Well, thank you very much. I'm really honored and happy to be here today. And I'd like to point out that parts of the research that I'll be talking, about, talking here today were actually funded by the first Defining Wisdom project. And it's really great to be back to Chicago. Um, yeah, I'll be talking about our attempts to develop a theory of how and why wisdom develops in just a few of us. So actually, that relates to what Ursula was just been saying. Um, I agree, uh, lay people and wisdom researchers probably agree with me that wisdom doesn't automatically come with age. On the contrary, many people age, but only few people really uh, achieve high levels of wisdom. And I was really interested from early on in why this is the case. So what is it that makes those few people wise? And most others, most of us will just become happy in the, in the course of their lives, hopefully, but maybe not that wise. So Susan Black and I have de uh, developed a model that we call the more life experience model. Um, and we've had a nice chance to write it up in the beautiful book by Michelle Ferrari and Nick Weststraight on personal wisdom that I'd recommend to all of you. Um, and this model basically assumes that the main catalysts for the development of wisdom are life challenges that happen to all of us at some point in our lives. And that's really the things, I think, Monica, you said life events, just those things that change our life more or less dramatically, that make us rethink the things that we thought before about life, and to just somewhat shatter the, the assumptions we had about life. And as I said, they, those things happen to all of us sometimes, um, not very often, and they teach all of us something. So probably most people would say that, uh, they've learned something from the challenges that happened in their lives. We learn a little bit while the challenge happens. We learn more probably after it has happened as we think back about it. And what we've learned feeds back into the way we, need, we, we deal with the next thing that happens in our lives and so on. But not all of us um, learn things that really make us wiser. As I said, some of us just learn things that make us happier, maybe, with our lives. Some of us may actually learn that the world is a really bad place to be and you should never trust anybody and end up being embittered. Those few who really develop wisdom, why are they able to learn the right things, even from difficult things that happen to them? And we believe that the main factor is something that we've just called resources. Um, and we have proposed four, or actually five, uh, resources that we consider particularly, impo oops, particularly important. And I'm actually not really happy with the labels of at least two of them, but the M-O-R-E acronym is just so nice that I'm <laughs> trying to keep it for the moment. I may end up giving up mastery for some point, so we've been discussing sore and core and I think poor or something, but more is just too nice. So I, I'll show you the definitions in a moment. Um, in developing this model, we've been looking at obviously theories about wisdom, but also lifespan developmental theories in general, and particularly on the literature on post-traumatic growth and related constructs, which is really about how some people are able to grow even from very different uh, difficult uh, experiences in their lives. So mastery um, may not be the right word because what we usually consider mastery is only one half of it. One half is really being able to master challenges in our lives actively by doing what needs to be done. It's actually very much related to what Monica was just talking about, being active, standing by our values and convictions and trying to realize our own potential. But the other half, which is at least equally important, and I've come to think may even be more important, is being aware of how many things in our lives are uncontrollable, to what degree it can happen at any point in time that something totally unexpected happens, and so on. And this is very much also related to what the Berlin Wisdom Model has called awareness and acceptance of uncertainty. Um, having no control illusions, basically. Being able to deal even with the fact that think that we can't control things as much as we'd like to. And I always have some little quotations here on the slides that are from a pro the project that I'll be talking about in a minute, and I don't have time to read them to you, so I hope you can read them for yourself. Um, the next is openness. Um, again, it has two aspects. One of them is pretty much what the Big Five defines as openness, which is being open and interested in new ideas, new people, new experiences, new cultures, whatever. The other goes beyond um, openness as a personality attribute and is more something like a, a value, again, or a motivation, because it's more um, about being tolerant, being non judge judgmentally accepting of other people's different views, perspectives, um, value orientations, and so on. 
And this is also something that people learn in the course of their lives. We believe this quotation is from a father who had um, a lot of trouble accepting that his, that his son turned out very different from what he had expected his son to be. But he really learned, learned that lesson and got to accept the way the, 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 his son had developed. Reflectivity is closely related to Monica's reflective dimension as well as to Jeff Webster's reflectivity or reflection component of wisdom, uh, as, which is also the case for openness, actually, and for motion regulation. Anyway, um, reflectivity um, is both about complexity, being able to deal with complex issues in their whole complexity, not trying to simplify things because the really difficult things in our lives aren't simple, usually. And reflective people are willing to accept and deal with the whole complexity of that. And it also obviously has this big component of self-reflection, which is really pretty much how Monica's reflective component is also defined, being able to look at things, including oneself, from different perspectives. Um, and we believe this is a core component and a core predictor of the development of wisdom. So keep in mind, these are not supposed to be components of wisdom, which is different from other models of wisdom. We believe that they are basically something like predecessors. People who are high in these resources will maybe um, be developing these resources even more in the course of their lives and will also be growing towards wisdom as they deal with the life experiences that happen in their lives. Um, the fourth is emotion regulation, and that also has two aspects, one of them as being attentive to and aware of one's own feelings, even if those are unwanted, ambivalent, negative, so really perceiving what one is really feeling, and the other is being able to deal with and regulate these emotions as situations may require. Um, and there's a second E, which makes it Marie, actually, um, which is empathy and could, should probably really be called sympathy. So that's the other one I'm not happy with in terms of the name. Um, so this is being willing and able to feel what others are feeling, to be aware of how others view a situation or how they feel in a situation, but not only being aware of that, also being concerned about that, caring about other people. So that relates to your compassionate dimension very much. So we believe strongly that in order to develop wisdom, you have to be relatively high in empathy. You have to be perceptive of and concerned about the feelings of other people. And if you have that feeling, then you may over time learn how to deal with other people's issues more effectively. OK, I've got the three minutes now already, so I'll talk faster from now on. So now this is what we did empirically. And as I mentioned, this was uh, also um, supported by the Defining Wisdom project. We were basically, what we did methodologically to come to Ursula's point uh, was we interviewed people about past challenges from their lives. And we tried to code for the more resources from those interviews. So we were hoping that wisdom nominees whom we recruited for this study would show higher levels of wisdom, of these more resources as well as of wisdom than other people. Then we were, hope, we were hoping that, these, that the more resource costs that we got from coding those interviews would be significantly and highly correlated to independent wisdom ratings of those same interviews. And we were also collecting data on lots of other measures of wisdom, several of them included, uh, developed by people in this room today. And we were hoping for significant correlations here too, obviously. So um, we had 47 wisdom nominees who agreed to participate in the study, and we had a sample of age and gender parallel control participants. We interviewed them about a non-specified difficult challenge from their lives, as well as for more specifically, specifically about an interpersonal conflict. And as I said, we had four different wisdom measures, three of them self-report and one a performance measure. Um, so as you can see here, um, in the conflict interview, the wisdom nominees showed higher levels of all five more resources. In the difficult event interview, we had some reliability issues, so it came out significantly only for two resources as well as for the total resource core. But anyway, we think these are quite convincing findings. Um, we also find really nice and high, very high correlations between those more resource codings and uh, independent code, uh, uh, ratings of wisdom for the same interviews, which were obviously done by other raters. Um, and we found um, not particularly high, but largely significant correlations between those more scores and the other measures of wisdoms that we used. These may really look kind of lowish, but when you look at the correlations between some of those different measures in our study, they are in the same range, basically. 
Okay, so I'd li just briefly like to mention that in addition to confirming my predictions largely, I learned some really interesting new things from that project. So the first thing was that my graduate student, Susanne Koenig, noticed that the wisdom nominees spent much more time talking about being grateful for something than the controlled participants did. And she actually did a, made a very nice dissertation out, out of this little observation. We also confirmed it in a second study. So wisdom has something to do with gratitude, with being aware of the importance of other people, of experiences for ourselves. And then second, um, another co-worker, Katja Naschenweng, did a li little ethnographic st study. She really considered the highly, most highly wise people in our sample as a different species, and she went to live with them for a few days, each of them, and to look at how they lived. And she also found that they valued other people very highly. She, they valued their partners, they valued friends, they valued serious conversations with friends, as well as serious media use, um, reading, philosophy, th things like that which all made me think about the importance of external resources. I'd always been thinking about those internal resources that I showed you, but now I believe that other people may be at least as important and resource, and we hope to look at that in our further research. Finally, another thing that, really, um, uh, that I find really intriguing is that while the, the correlations of 0.80 between the two different ratings for each interview were really nice, the other thing that really surprised me, that people who were talking very wisely about a conflict in their lives might be talking much less wisely about another difficult event in their lives. These correlations were really also quite low, which means that not only do wisdom levels vary across situations, with, which we know at least since the experimental studies by Ursula Staudinger 20 years ago and by Igor Grossman more recently, um, it, there also seem to be differences as we, talk, as we think back about experiences that we've had a long time ago. We may be very wise about one experience, but much less so about another one. And again, that may have something to do with talking to people about experiences we've had. And I think that's another thing that I want to look at. Just as the very last slide, what we're doing now is uh, starting a longitudinal study to really test the predictions of our model longitudinally, which will probably take 20 years or something, but I'm hoping to get there. Um, so what we'll be doing will, is every year around the birthday, participants will be contacted and asked to report whether something significant has happened in their lives, and we'll measure their more resources and wisdom levels and see whether the longitudinal patterns predict what we uh, are, looking, are hoping for from our more life experience model. Thank you very much. Um, going back to a uh, sense of gratitude and wisdom relationship, I think that's fascinating. When, um, when you say sense of gratitude, are they expressing their sense of gratitude to other people or Good question. someone that's not even people or something or higher being? That was one of the many slides I had to skip for this talk. So one thing was they were grat grateful for life experiences, actually. We coded this in quite some detail, and she did a second study where she actually collected data in a different way and asked them what they were grateful for. They were grateful for experiences, even if they were negative experiences, more often than the control participants. They, again, were grateful for particular persons, in particular their partners, which I find quite amazing. These were like older people having been married for like 30 years or something and then still saying you're grateful that your partner is living with you is quite an accomplishment, I'd say. Some, they also mentioned more often being grateful to God, I think, but that was uh, actually different from your study, Monica. This is a European sample, so generally they would be much less religious, but I believe that um, Gratitude to God in one of the two studies was also more frequent in the wisdom nominees. The control participants were more often grateful to their family of origin. So they basically said, I'm grateful to my parents because they paid for my education or something like that, which was the less, what was less frequent in the wise participants. Yeah, here. Um, I'm not very much familiar with this type of research, but um, I have a question about whether you include some variables in which you don't expect to find an effect. That is, uh, so would you, if you include other questions about other potential um, variables that are behind wisdom, but you don't think that they will have an effect, do you, do, do, you, do you include those variables in the studies or you get always uh, significant effects for all the variables you include? So what were you, I'm not sure. So I do you include some variables in the test to check whether uh, your predictions will be falsified in some way? Um. 
we, we collected lots of additional variables. We collected intelligence. We collected personality variables. We collected well-being, actually. Um, a lot of different things. We didn't collect things like in this discriminant validity approach, things that we wouldn't want to be predictive, uh, and we didn't, we didn't really check for that. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really wonderful to hear you, hear you in, in person uh, yeah, after uh, following, your, following you and so, so many people's readings for so long. Um, there's a theme that's already emerged from your talk and Monica's about the centrality of emotional uh, mm -hmm. variables, uh, emotional usually framed as self-regulation to wisdom. And there's a real question, it seems, as is, which is up for debate, is emotional regulation intrinsic to wisdom or is it, on the other hand, a complementary virtue? And on the one hand, this yeah. often seems to be an assumption in the literature that's intrinsic. And if we look at the historical literature, the phenomenological, the contemplative, uh, the philosophical, etc., it really is, in all those traditions that I'm aware of, very carefully discriminated as, a, a fa as mutually facilitating virtues. Buddhists would say it's the co-arising of positive mental factors, Western philosophy, the antiquity or complementarity of virtues. So it seems like it would be a, a something for us to keep in mind as we follow this discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a very good point. I mean, I've been thinking very much about this whole issue of are certain aspects that we are having in our model, are they really predecessors of wisdom? Are they something that comes with wisdom? Are they also outcomes of development, which is certainly true for mastery? And I believe that the, the sensitivity to one's own and others' emotions is something that's there early on in life, right? And that may be something that actually, actually puts you on the path toward the development of wisdom because it makes you more attentive to to feelings than other people are, basically. And if it comes together with something like a high level of reflectivity and some other things, probably, um, you may also learn to regulate your emotions more effectively if you're more attentive to them. And generally, I believe that these five resources are some kind of interacting syndrome of things. So if people have more of them, they'll be reinforcing themselves over time, and that will actually be part of the pathway towards wisdom, like these things reinforcing themselves over time if they come together. Uh, Judith, I got really excited about this ethnographic study. Um, I, I think it's, it's high time, and I really I think it's great that you've taken on that challenge. Can you give us a bit more detail? I mean, we all know ethnography sounds easy. Maybe it doesn't even sound easy. It is very difficult. Yeah. So could you, um, I mean, anthropology has made an art of it and a, a real skill and, and science of it because it's not as easy, you know, you just walk along with these Absolutely. guys and yeah. Uh, yeah. you are obviously intervening by being present. And so could you give us a bit more detail? I can give you just a bit more because I'm really not that familiar with the study. I just love the findings. Uh, the colleague who did the study actually is, uh, she's an educational scientist, but she did an ethnographic study for her dissertation or something, and she trained with someone who does this kind of work. So I'm assuming that she knows what she did. What she did basically was really she selected the five wisest participants from our sample and asked them if she could just really come and live with them and see the way they live for, I think, a few days each. And then she was taking all those field notes and then afterwards, I don't know, trying to combine them into some meaningful things. She was actually, I, I don't think she did, uh, she was very much an observer. I think she talked to them a lot. She basically just asked them how they were living, what was important to them and so on. So I'm not sure if it's really like the the optimal methodological approach. I, I just don't know enough about it. But he really got some key findings out of this study that I find amazingly important. Another one is like nature is a major resource for these people. It seems things, little things like they are all living on hilltops or mountaintops somewhere. They all have a, have a view. So that seems to be very important. None of them is living in those really rich environments, they, but they all have this kind of very much self self-designed space that they live in. So she got lots of little nice findings that may just trigger further more traditional psychological research, I think. And I found the, the importance of other people really extreme. I mean, this goes back to your interactive minds thing. Again, Ursula has done all of this 20 years ago. But still, I think this is really a fascinating idea that we should really keep following. Thank you for both uh, really thoughtful presentations. Um, it's bringing to mind, uh, for me, the similarities between 
another domain, very large uh, research domain called resilience. Mm -hmm. um, I'm yeah. thinking of yeah. Unger's work, who talks about going over and over uh, experiences of dealing with adversity, and um, you know Richardson's the reintegration yeah. of struggle and the reintegrations of, of resilience. Would you speak to uh, differences, similarities? I mean, one is clearly the domain of value yeah. that doesn't yeah. seem yeah. to come up yeah. as much in the resilience literature. Um, yeah. Any thoughts? Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot. I've been trying to kind of master the resilience literature, but it's really so, so diverse in itself, you know, so many different approaches and definitions, and some of them relate much more closely to wisdom than others. When you look at those original definitions by Amy Werner and others, which were basically just about kids getting on with their life, even though they had come from very difficult situations. That's, I think, extremely in important and interesting research, but it's not, kind of not sufficient for really talking about wisdom, right? Wisdom would be, somehow, somehow I would feel wisdom would go beyond resilience in having this strong self-transcendence component again. So we come back to a, a, an issue again, this whole idea of values, of being, being more than just um, living a good life for yourself, right? But I know there are some resilience definitions that go in this direction too, so I really think this is a kind of difficult because it's two vague concepts. Both of them have been defined in multiple ways, so it's really hard to bring them together in a consistent way. Uh, thank you very much. I'm an outsider to this field, so I guess my question is really more uh, a broad uh, inquiry around uh, circularity. So if you have wise nominees, yeah. or p the, the top five that were selected for the ethnographic study, and at the same time you're trying to probe what this construct is, how do you, yeah. how do you address that? I mean, basically, we're not, we're not really trying to, we do, uh, we did proceed from a definition, but you're obviously right, it's, it's, I mean, wisdom, there's always, I think, a certain circularity to wisdom research, because it's just not something you can measure in some kind of objective way, so it's the same with all our measures, you know, we try to say, I've got this great new measure of wisdom, so how can I prove it's a measure of wisdom, I can show it correlates to other measures of wisdom, or that wisdom nominates, nominees score higher, because there's just no, kind of outside criterion, and for some reason this is more of a problem with wisdom than with other things like intelligence. I don't know why exactly, but that seems to be the case. The reason we, uh, we didn't really think, and we, it turned out we were very right not to think that all of our wisdom nominees would really be highly wise. The reason we included them was really just to uh, get the chance to oversample this, this rare phenomenon, you know? So if you have like half of, the, uh, if half of your sample is wisdom nominees, there's a chance that maybe 10% of your sample may be really, really, really wise. So that's what, why we did it, not really because we were thinking all of them would be high on wisdom. It also turned out the nominators differed very much in why, in why they nominated a person, and that made a big, had a big influence on how wise the person really turned out to be. But I totally agree with you about the circularity point. That's one of the many problems that we're facing. 